Uh, this is the lecture that would have been given on the 30th of April 2015, class number 30. This is the last lecture of the semester, so congratulations, you made it through. Let's look through a couple of announcements before we start talking about channel design. First of all, as I mentioned in our last class period, uh, homework 14 is canceled. We worked through the concepts of that assignment during the in-class exercise that we did with Excel, so no need to submit that assignment, but you should definitely submit your project. Now remember the deadline for that is by 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, uh, Thursday the 30th. I just noticed that that says 4.29. Thursday's the 30th, so turn it in by the 30th. Uh, what you need to upload is a, a single PDF file with the entire report, uh, consolidated into that one file including uh, an explanation, an overview of what you did for the project, and of course the pieces of that were the demand estimation, the network design, including maps for both conditions, uh, both the full flow and the static condition. You need to include information about the sizing of your reservoir, and then the uh, cost analysis, which identifies the expense associated with all of the pipes that are going to be in the network and the reservoir. So submit that report by 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 30th of April. Uh, and uh, regarding the final exam, the screen's a little bit locked up right now. There we go. Uh, for the final exam, that is going to be held on Tuesday, the 5th of May at 12.45 p.m. in our normal Engineering Lab 101 classroom. I've got a couple of questions already about what's going to be on the final exam. Uh, it's my intention that the majority of the points earned are going to be related to points, uh, r related to material we've covered since the second midterm exam. Uh, but it's impossible to just isolate those topics since our subject sort of naturally builds on itself. So you can't just ignore things from earlier in the semester. So there could be questions from any time during the semester, but the majority of the points will be related to things since exam two. Uh, how long is it going to be? How many questions? I don't know exactly how many questions yet because I haven't written the exam. But my intention is to make it approximately as long as the midterm exams were. So that is, I expect that the typical student will be able to solve it within 75 minutes. And of course, we have two hours allocated for that. So if the average student spends 75 minutes, then even the slow students will be able to finish it up with no problem in the 120 minutes that we've got scheduled. As I announced previously, you can have two equation sheets. You can use both sides of the page, 8.5 by 11, standard letter size paper. You can put whatever you want on there, including um, uh, procedures, solved examples, formulas, whatever you'd like. The final exam is 20% of, uh, of the course grade, so it's an important test, but uh, I doubt that there will be any surprises. Either way, you know, students who have been doing well so far will probably continue to do well, so don't get too stressed out about studying for finals. If you go through the examples, you go through the homework assignments, and you understand the material, not just you can substitute numbers into equations. That's not understanding the material, but if you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, you'll be fine for the exam. Um, the problem with pipes when they are carrying a very low flow rate is that the water is moving slowly, it doesn't aerate, very much. You know, when it's just sort of stagnant and not moving quickly, then oxygen doesn't get transferred into the wastewater, and the waste that is in the wastewater breaks down the oxygen, uses it up, and then the, uh, the waste products, that the sulfur in particular, are um, consumed anaerobically. And so hydrogen sulfide is what happens when there's sulfur dissolved in the water, and it gets uh, used up anaerobically. It's a poisonous gas where concentrations as low as 300 ppm are fatal. And uh, the especially scary thing about it is that at first you'll smell it, but then it desensitizes uh, your smell and, and so that you don't have the capacity to smell it after the first few minutes. And so you'll think maybe, oh, I smelled something, but now it's gone, when really it's not gone. It's just that you can't smell it anymore and you're about to succumb to hydrogen sulfide poisoning. Uh, people who work in enclosed spaces often have to carry with them little monitors that will uh, alert them against hydrogen sulfide, but 
from the hydraulic design standpoint, what we want to do is ensure the minimum velocities to help prevent BOD, uh, which is the, the waste that is in wastewater, from being converted into hydrogen sulfide. And this is an empirical equation that just allows you to estimate how much BOD potential there might be, uh, how much potential for generating hydrogen sulfide based on the concentration of waste in the water and then some of the hydraulic parameters like the flow rate, the slope of the channel, uh, and then the wetted perimeter to the uh, top width. And according to this empirical model that if you calculate a Z value less than 5,000, then probably hydrogen sulfide won't be formed. 10,000, it probably will be formed. And then there's this middle ground where it's possible and you just have to sort of um, be looking out for it. So here's an example that just works through the uh, both the partially flow sewer, partially full sewer, and also the impact of having uh, the BOD, which is the wastewater constituent in there. In this example, we're taking a look at a sanitary sewer where it's given that the diameter of the pipe is 750 millimeters. And we know that the temperature of the water that's flowing through it, the wastewater has a temperature of 33 degrees Celsius. Uh, the slope of the pipe is given as 0.8% which we're going to need to express as 0 0.008. And um, the roughness of the material, the N value, is 0 0.013 for concrete. So what we're going to do is try and find out the geometric parameters of the wetted perimeter, top width, depth, and then find the uh, probability of hydrogen sulfide formation. What we're going to start with is this equation for uh, finding the angle theta in radians. And as it appeared on screen previously, that is that theta to the negative two-thirds power times theta minus the sine of theta to the five-thirds power minus 20.16 times nq times diameter to the negative eight-thirds power slope to the negative one-half power is equal to zero. Now this is an alternate approach to the spreadsheet method that we have used previously. And what we're going to do is substitute in all the values from above along with the known flow rate of um, 0.92 cubic meters per second. And we're going to try and find out uh, what is theta. And so we have theta to the negative two-thirds power, theta minus sine of theta to the five-thirds power, minus 20.16 times the n value of 0 0.013. Now the flow rate is 0.92 cubic meters per second. The diameter of the pipe is given as 0 0.75 meters to the negative 8 thirds power. The slope is 0 0.008 to the negative 1 half power and set that equal to 0. So if you have an equation solving calculator or you could solve this one in Excel as well, what you'll find is that the angle is 4.23 radians. And so we have a pipe that's more than half full because remember from previously, half full would be pi radians. But in this case, here is the water surface. And um, we can find the geometric parameters that we need, like the wetted perimeter. P is the diameter of the pipe times the angle divided by 2. And so we have a 0.75 meter diameter pipe. The angle is 4.23 radians and we divide that by 2. So we get that the wetted perimeter is 1.586 meters. And so what we're talking about for that length is what is the distance around the wetted perimeter here. Okay. Uh, we want to know the top width 
and the top width formula that was on the screen previously, it's this this distance here, it was assigned the variable b in that uh, image, so the top width b is the diameter times the sine of theta divided by 2. So for us that's the diameter of 0.75 meters and then sine of 4.23 divided by 2. And so the top width is 0 0.642 meters. Now let's just do a quick sanity check here. We know that uh, the top width can't be any larger than the pipe diameter. You know, if the pipe is halfway, if the water is halfway full in the pipe, then the top width would be 0 .75, 0 0.75 meters at most. And so we know the water level is a little bit higher than halfway. So I think that this passes the reasonableness check and uh, we can now go on to calculate the depth of the water and uh, the depth of the water is y is equal to the diameter divided by 2 times 1 minus the cosine of theta divided by 2 okay so it's our diameter of 0.75 meters divided by 2 1 minus the cosine of our angle 4.23 radians divided by 2 and that gives us a depth of 0 0.569 meters and so that is the distance from the water surface down to the bottom of the pipe like there so we know what the uh, the flow conditions look like, the geometry, and now we're going to use all of that in calculating Z, which is just sort of a um, an empirical way of estimating the likelihood of hydrogen sulfide forming. And the first step of that is to find the effective BOD. BOD is a way of estimating the strength of wastewater. Biological oxygen demand is a pollutant that uh, when it enters water streams will deprive dissolved oxygen from the aquatic life that needs it. And so to find the effective BOD, which accounts for the temperature of the water, we have BOD times 1.07 to the power of T minus 20. And this is a pretty common um, correction factor that takes into account bacteria are more active when the water is warmer. You know, they speed up their action. Food spoils more quickly when you've got warm weather and in the same way bacteria use up the BOD and form hydrogen sulfide more quickly when the weather is warm. Uh, and so what we have as our BOD was given as 350 milligrams per liter. So that would be the BOD at a temperature of 20 but we need to correct because our given temperature is uh, 33 degrees, so 33 minus 20, so we're going to take it to the power of 13. And that gives us an effective BOD of 843 milligrams per liter. So now we can put that into the formula for Z. Our equation for Z is it is 0 0.308 times EBOD divided by the slope of the channel to the one-half power, the flow rate to the one-third power, and then the wetted perimeter divided by the top width B. And we'll substitute in those values. It's 0 0.308. For our coefficient, the effective BOD is 843 milligrams per liter. Divide that by the slope of 0 0.008 to the power of one half, 0.92, the flow rate which we do to the one third power, and then the geometric parameters. We found previously that our wetted perimeter is 1.586 meters, and the top width is 0.642. Now, long story short, the quicker water is moving, the less likely it is that hydrogen sulfide is going to form. It forms when the temperature is warm or when the water is moving slowly and there are 
there's a lack of oxygen in the wastewater is when hydrogen sulfide forms. So in this case, we calculate that the Z is 7373. And our conclusion that we draw from that, since it's in the, the range uh, that was previously specified, is that hydrogen sulfide may form. We don't know that it necessarily will, uh, but it might, depending on how long the wastewater is flowing through the sewer. In channel design, we'll mostly be, as engineers, sizing lined channels. Here's a concrete lined channel. You can see it's trapezoidal. This one happens to be meandering in shape. And uh, there's a nice grassy right-of-way on either side of the channel. Um, those are often put there so that someone could drive along the channel and inspect it, trying to look for any uh, cracks in the concrete or uh, looking for the growth of uh, weeds, because if, if weeds grow, then they can reduce the hydraulic capacity. So inspection is an important thing, but trying to optimize the capacity of that channel is a big part of what a hydraulic designer would do. You know, you're trying to balance how expensive it is to excavate, because excavating material and hauling it away is going to cost money, but if you don't go down, then you have to make the channel wider. And of course, you'll notice that this has neighbors in the backyard here. You know, you have to buy land if you make the channel very wide. And so engineering is always about optimizing and balancing costs. And uh, that comes into play with uh, open channel design as well. Here is an unlined channel. This looks like it's just sort of a, a ditch in someone's backyard that's formed. It's going to have a much higher end value because of the uh, irregularity of the channel and also because of the grass that's growing in there. Uh, here's a channel that is lined with rocks to try and prevent scour and erosion. This is actually the outfall of a culvert and it goes around this bend and then enters a grass-lined channel around that way. And then here they're doing construction on what ultimately will become a uh, a plastic lined channel. This is going to have compacted clay and then they put down what's called a geomembrane or a, a thick layer of plastic to try and prevent water from being lost. Uh, but in um, constructed channel design we're trying to consider the slope that's available. You're moving water over the surface one, from one place to another uh, probably the one factor that affects the capacity of the channel more than anything else is how steep it is. And uh, you can't really make the channel any steeper than the slope of the ground. You can make it less steep by meandering back and forth. You can't make it any steeper, otherwise your channel starts to go down underground. Um, you're trying to balance the effect of the channel geometry on the velocities that can be seen. And velocity is important in the case of hydraulic design of an open channel because if you have it too fast then it will scour the, the, the bed and sometimes these are made out of um, clay and earth and you want to avoid the scour of the bed but if it's too low then sediment may drop out of the flow and start to line the bottom of the channel or uh, weeds can form. There are some cases where you actually want water to infiltrate into the soil because water is considered a waste like this channel here is probably just receiving stormwater runoff. And so here you'd love it if water seeps down underground because then that means less water that's going to make its way into the stream. Um, but in other cases, like in Arizona, where they have a 100-plus mile channel that takes water from the mountains into Phoenix, infiltration is really a, a, a big problem. They don't want water seeping from their channel. They want as much of it to be conveyed to the city as possible. So we'll, we'll step through some of these considerations. And um, in open channels, we can have lined, unlined, and grass-lined channels. By lined, we usually mean uh, with concrete or some, sometimes paved with asphalt. For erodible channels, most common, what we're working with is a clay, a compacted clay. And a grass-lined channel is kind of in between. It provides some resistance against scour, but ultimately uh, not as much as a lined channel would. Um, 
We've already talked about the sections that are the most hydraulically effective, those that can maximize the amount of water that flows through them while minimizing flow area. Because by minimizing flow area, you're reducing the amount that has to be excavated and hauled away. And uh, you're also reducing the amount of uh, liner that has to be installed. And so if you want to calculate flow area, this is Manning's equation rearranged to, to solve for flow area. The things that you can do to reduce the flow area is to have a big slope or a small flow rate, a small end value. Those are some of the parameters that we have directly under our control. How to minimize the flow area and therefore minimize the cost. Is that yep, that's Florida. Yeah. They've got a lot of really long straight canals down there to help drain swamps and increase the uh, availability to develop land. 26 miles, yeah, that's long. I bet it was hot too, right? Oh, okay. Well, I don't feel so bad for you then. The best trapezoidal channel is one that has a, uh, a basically it's a half a hexagon. The main reason I point this out, this figure, is to introduce the term freeboard. And when you're designing a channel, you not only want to provide enough capacity just so that the water line, you wouldn't necessarily want the water line right up to the very edge. Uh, freeboard is provided in case if you're going around the bend, actually the water surface curves around the bend. Um, there's something called super elevation. And if you had a tight radius curve, like this is our cross section, a trapezoidal cross section, and the water is going around a bend like this, then the surface may actually be tilted like that as it goes around a bend. And if the velocities are high, obviously it's going to be more pronounced than if the velocities are low. But one of the reasons why you put a little extra height above where you expect the water surface to be is for um, super elevation around a curve. It may be because of splashing. Um, it could be that there's going to be a hydraulic jump in the channel and there's going to be a lot of vigorous mixing and so um, freeboard considerations take that into account and there happens to be on the equation sheet one of the unfamiliar equations that you don't really need to know because you're not going to get an equation on the, you're not going to get a problem on the exam having to do with freeboard but I did notice that a freeboard equation was on here somewhere unless I'm mistaken. I might have taken it off now no, that I think about it. Too many? Just cross out the ones you don't think you're going to use. Yeah. So freeboard um, varies based on the quantity of water you expect to carry and also uh, the width of the channel is going to affect the super elevation. But here are some of the geometric parameters for what's the, considered the best geometry, best in terms of minimizing the flow area, A, based on a certain depth, Y. Now, uh, there's a couple of different slopes. We talk about the side slopes, and you know we've already talked, uh, talked about side slopes and uh, how the side slope factors into calculating the cross-sectional area. But how steep you can go with a side slope depends on what the channel is going to be made out of. If you're going to have a channel that is built out of rock, then you could actually have a vertical side slope. You can get away with the rectangular channel that we're always using in our calculations just because it's numerically easier. You wouldn't be able to get away with a rectangular channel if you're digging into sand. Right? A sand channel isn't going to look like this sharp edge, but you could if you had concrete or if you had rock. So the side slopes that you s select are governed by how cohesive the material is. The longitudinal slopes are just governed by the surrounding geography. If you're in a flat area, then your longitudinal slopes are going to be relatively mild, like that picture of Florida. This, Florida is not a very hilly state. And so their channels are very, very uh, flat. 
Steep slopes may cause channel erosion, and so the way that can be prevented is with meandering. If you have a hill, then you can have the channel winding back and forth, and by winding back and forth, you have a more moderate slope than if you went straight down. Because remember that the slope is the change in elevation divided by the length. And so you reduce the slope here. This meandering path, the reason why it has a lower slope is because you're increasing L. You're taking a longer distance to get from point A to point B. In the straight line, you have a relatively small L, but in the meandering slope, you've got a big L. So it's just like skiing. If you've been skiing or snowboarding before, the way that you avoid going too fast is by going side to side down the hill. Here are some typical side slopes that can be tolerated in a variety of different materials. You'll notice that if you've got sandy materials, then maybe the best you can do is a three to one side slope, whereas with rock, you may be able to have a vertical side slope. And there's a variety of side slopes in between depending on what the material is that's being used. Okay, so freeboard and super elevation is that splashing that we talked about. And there's an empirical relationship that um, if you know basically how deep the flow is going to be, why, and you know the flow rate, then you can, collect, you can uh, select a C value. This C value is just strictly empirical that you interpolate between given flow rates. And then you can calculate in meters what the required freeboard is. We won't work an example with this freeboard equation. It's, um, it's not of primary importance. It's just sort of a, an empirical estimation of how much extra capacity you'd want to give so that when you're going around a bend, the water doesn't spill out the side of the channel. And here's the equation that allows you to calculate super elevation height. Super elevation is the difference between the uh, lower end and the upper end. And so you can see this little black line here, the difference between the bottom end and the upper end. You could calculate based on the velocity of the flow, T, the top width of the channel, G is the gravitational constant, and then R is the radius of curvature. And so over here on the board, when I was drawing a curve that was like this, our radius of curvature is this. And so the tighter the turn, and if you had a turn that was of a larger radius, then that's going to lead to less super elevation. And it's down here in the denominator. So the larger the turn radius, the less the water is going to slosh around to the side as you're going around uh, a bend. And this is a lot like when we were talking about um, Euler's equation and the effect that has in fluid mechanics of um, if you're accelerating a, a liquid, then the water will rise on one side of a container. Well, this is a centripetal acceleration when the water goes around a curve like this. And so this is actually, this equation is fundamental for estimating the difference in elevation uh, due to going around a bend. <clears throat> So the question comes down to, should we line the channel or leave it unlined? Because a lined channel costs more money, but it does bring with it certain advantages. Um, if you've got a concrete lined channel, then that's going to enable you to have higher velocities. And therefore, it reduces the cross-sectional area if you've got a higher velocity going through it. You know, if you wanted to use up as little land area as possible, then maybe you'll take the straight line path from A to B. You know, if water's going down the mountain in a straight line path, you're going to have to line the channel with concrete to try and make it more resistant to scour because the velocities are going to be very high. Uh, another advantage of using a line channel is that generally that decreases the amount of lost water due to seepage. So if water's considered a precious resource and you don't want to lose it, then a line channel enables you to avoid that. On the other hand, um, the, the unlined channel is good if, if you're using like water as a waste. If you're trying to get rid of storm water, then, um, then an unlined channel is better from, from that perspective. To design the line channel, then uh, you first start off with selecting the material. 
and uh, the flow rate that has to be carried. Selecting the material is often just a function of talking to the material resource providers in the area, you know, the people who provide concrete, or it might be that uh, you have access to a geosynthetic liner, like a plastic liner that could go on top of clay section. And then you find the end value for that material. The flow rate to be carried would be given to you by the hydrologist saying, you know, what the flow rate coming out of a canyon where you're trying to convey the water from place to place, or it might be that you're conveying water to a water treatment plant, in which case the flow rate is maybe dictated by the demands of the flow, uh, by the water treatment plant. Uh, the end values related to the material, the freeboard coefficient would be selected based on this interpolation and the, uh, the calculation for how much extra capacity over and above where the water surface turns out for freeboard. Um, computing normal depth of flow from Manning's equation is how we find the depth. And then you check the velocity and the Froude number. And the reason why is that typically you want to avoid supercritical flow if you can because it's prone to scour. And if you get supercritical flow in a certain section, then uh, it's going to have to go through a hydraulic jump when it transitions to subcritical flow. So you want to avoid supercritical flow, even though hydraulic jumps are fun to look at, they can be a little bit unpredictable and risky if you have one and you don't know exactly where the jump is going to set up and it, you know, you're not prepared for it, it can cause problems. Um, the rule of thumb is that if you've got a uh, non-reinforced lining, you want to have the flow rate under 2.1 meters per second. So non-reinforced would mean like uh, if you have uh, concrete, but it's not heavily armored concrete. But if, if you have uh, a channel that is um, going to have really high velocities, you can have up to 5.5 uh, meters per second if you've got a reinforced lining. All right, so here's an example that takes us through the process of designing a reinforced concrete trapezoidal channel. Okay, well we're going to work through an example where we're trying to design a lined channel. And uh, in this example, we know that the flow rate that needs to be conveyed by the channel has a value of 2.4 cubic meters per second. The slope that the channel is following is 0 0.005. And um, we're going to go through the steps uh, one by one as they appear up on the screen there. And the first step is to select the material and identify the flow rate. So we've already sort of done the second part, but what we're going to do is line this with concrete. So we're going to use concrete, and again, Q is 2.4 cubic meters per second. That's what must be carried through the channel. Um, our second step, it says to estimate the roughness coefficient and then also the freeboard coefficient. Um, the first one's relatively easy. We can look, look it up from a table. And just to be a little bit conservative, let's use an end value of 0 0.015. Now we often use a lower end value than that, like maybe 0 0.013. But using 0 0.015 isn't a bad idea if you want to assume that maybe uh, the concrete hasn't been finished very smoothly or um, that it may, over time, be less smooth if there's some damage and cracks and so we'll just use that end value and now the uh, the coefficient for freeboard is a little bit more complicated what we are given is uh, some values that say C is 1.5 when the flow rate is 0 0.57 cubic meters per second and we know that the C value should be 2.5 when we have a flow rate of 85 cubic meters per second. Now our flow rate of 2.4 isn't either one of these and so what we'll do is we'll end up interpolating and just to give a graphical idea of what that looks like here's our flow rate we have a data point at 
0.57 and we've got a data point at 85 cubic meters per second and at 0.57 we know that the C value is 1.5 and at 85 we know the C value is 2.5 so essentially we have a linear relationship in, de in between we assume and uh, the slope of this line is 0 0.01184 units of C per cubic meters per second. Okay, so what C value should we use? The C value we're going to use for our flow rate is 1.5 because that's how much C you have at the lowest flow rate of 0.57 but we're above 0.57, so it's going to be 1.5 plus 0 0.01184, the slope of the line, times whatever flow rate is beyond 0 0.57. Okay, so 1.5 plus 0 0.01184 times uh, 2.4 minus 0 0.57. Okay, that gives us a C value that we're going to use of 1.522. The third step in our process is that we want to compute the normal depth of flow. So normal depth y sub n, assuming that conditions are going to be steady and uniform. We just want to know what's going to be the flow depth. Now, um, let's design this channel so that it is using the best geometry. Remember from previous slides, uh, the best means the most hydraulically efficient. And so we're going to use the best geometry. Now the best geometry means that the wetted perimeter, the most efficient wetted perimeter, is going to be 2 times the square root of 3 times the normal depth. Uh, the area is going to be square root of 3 times the normal depth squared. The bottom width is going to be 2 root 3 divided by 3 times the normal depth. And then the side slope we should use is square root of 3 divided by 3. Okay, so we're going to put those parameters into Manning's equation. Manning's equation for SI units is uh, the area divided by the N value, and then area divided by wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds power, and the slope to the 1 half power. Okay, so we can substitute in uh, everything that we know. We know the flow rate is 2.4 cubic meters per second. The area is square root of 3 times y sub n squared divided by the n value of 0 0.015. All right, now here we've got the area again, root 3 times normal depth squared divided by... 2 root 3 divided by 3 times y. Oops, I made a mistake. It's just 2 root 3 divided by y. Here's our wetted perimeter. Okay, so let me cross that out fully. Okay, so area divided by wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds power, and now the slope of 0 0.005 to the 1 half power. And so how do we find what is the normal depth? Well, you can put it into your programmable equation-solving calculator. Uh, you can type this expression into Excel, and uh, your goal seek would be find the y sub n that gives you an overall flow rate of 2.4. So we go through either of those processes that we can find that the normal depth is 0 0.5, I'm sorry, 0.7514 meters. So that's the depth of flow under normal conditions. And uh, the rest of our geometry, when it's flowing at that depth, then the bottom width is going to be 0.8676 meters, because I can just put that normal depth in here for B. Uh, we're going to have 
a top width of the trapezoidal channel will be 1.7357 meters and from before the side slope is a constant that's not affected by the flow depth but we can put it in decimal form it's 0.577 all right so step four is we want to know what is the flow velocity and the reason this is important is that we want to check and make sure that sediment doesn't settle into our channel we have to have enough velocity to keep sediment from uh, from laying down in the channel bed and we also want to see if the water will be moving quickly enough to prevent vegetation from growing a good flow velocity will scour both of those things we just use the continuity equation V is going to be Q divided by A Okay, and our flow rate from before is 2.4 cubic meters per second. And the cross-sectional area we know is the square root of 3 times the depth, which we determined to be 0.7514 meters. And we square that. So the flow velocity is 2.45 meters per second. That's great. That's above the 0.9 minimum for preventing sediment and above the 0.75 minimum of preventing vegetation from growing. Now, we want to find out for our channel how much freeboard to provide. And so, let me just draw a little sketch that will illustrate what we're talking about. And here's our trapezoidal channel. And the water is going to have a depth of 0.7514 meters. But we don't want to build the channel only up to the edge of the water. We want to provide some extra uh, distance above it in case it's windy, in case they're splashing, uh, maybe just a, a little bit of extra capacity. And the formula that's provided to estimate how much pre freeboard should be given is F is 0.55 times the square root of our C value we determined, 1.522 times the depth of flow, 0.7514 meters. Okay. Um, and that means the freeboard that we need is 0.588 meters. So we're going to give 0.588 meters above the water surface to the edge of the trapezoid. Um, now remember that super elevation is talking about when water goes around a curve, how much is it going to slosh to one side? So imagine, now let me draw a top view. We're looking at our channel from above and it's going around some curve. And let's just say that the radius of that curve is five meters. You know, that's a relatively sharp radius. Um, so we want to know how much is the water going to slosh up to one side when it's going around that curve. Let's estimate that using the formula uh, that tells us the height of super elevation. We should estimate by squaring the velocity multiplied by the top width of the channel divided by g times the radius of curvature. Okay, And so here the velocity we previously determined is 2.45 meters per second. Square that. The top width we determined was 1.7357 meters divided by G, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. And then we'll just see what it does when there is a 5 meter radius of curvature. When we do that, we get the height of super elevation is 0 0.212 meters. And what that's calculating is the total deflection from the lower edge up to the top edge, 0 0.212 meters. 
You know, what's the difference in elevation going to be as it goes around that corner? And the good news is, is that the freeboard that we're going to give the channel of 0.588 is plenty. You know, we're only going to have it rising half of the super elevation on the left side. So it's going to be going up 1.06 meters on the left, but so from here to here would be 0.106. From that edge up to the top of the channel is 0.588. So we've got plenty of extra freeboard available. So even when it's going around that curve, we'll be okay for wind-driven waves and so on. In unlined channel, you have to go through and compare the shear stress that's applied to the uh, applied to the channel surface with the cohesive strength of the soil. And uh, so if you don't have concrete there, the question is, is if water is flowing over earth, is the water, is the shear stress of the water going to disrupt the earth? Or is the earth holding together with enough strength that it won't be scoured? And what this graph shows you is for the particle size in inches and the angularity of the soil, what a typical angle of response is. An angle of response is if you're starting to make a, a stack of some material, what the angle with the horizontal would be. And so you can calculate the shear stress on the bottom of the channel by the, the slope of the energy grade line, the hydraulic radius, and the unit weight of the fluid that is being transported in the channel. And so what you would do in an analysis like this, if you've got an unlined channel, is you would use this expression to calculate the shear stress, and then you'd go through a soil analysis and try and find out what's the cohesive strength of the soil. So in the case of the, the hydraulic engineer would just get an answer from the geotechnical engineers, what's the, uh, the strength of the soil, the shear stress, shear stress strength of the soil. Um, the design procedure has some similarities to what we do when we have a lined channel, except that we're going to want to have much lower velocities than we would in the case of a uh, lined channel because um, the, the concrete was able to resist a lot more scour than a, an unlined channel will.